like to now introduce Mark Harvey, who is the executive director of Internews, and he's sitting on my far left over here at the end of the table. And since joining Internews Europe, Mark has co-led alliance building between humanitarian agencies, the UN, British and Irish Red Cross, Save the Children UK, to improve their use of local media and technology while distributing humanitarian assistance in crisis zones. And he's currently working to finalize a report on communications with the population affected by the 2011 Japan triple disaster. And I think this is going to be launched in, in early March. But I think it would re be really good, Mark, if you could give us your reflections on what you think are some of the takeaways from, from this ex the experience of Info's Aid and specifically from the paper. Sure, yes, thank, thank you, Wendy. Um, this is, in fact, the last piece of work for the, uh, the Infos Aid team, and I, I think I can speak on behalf of uh, both BBC Media Action and Internews in thanking Anita and Carol for doing such a, a thorough piece of work on this paper. And I think we welcome both the analysis but also the candour and transparency with <coughs> which it actually does feature some of the challenges uh, that the, the pilot projects did, did encounter. Um, I would like to to reflect on some of the the kind of takeaways that uh, that I you know that have struck me in the paper. But before I do so, I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit about the the changing role of media development organisations, mm. which is referenced a couple of times in in the paper, um, and I think that's useful context for us for us all. Um, over the past decade, uh, the larger the larger media development organisations have grown. First of all, they have they've increased their capacity, but they've increased their geographic reach, which means that perhaps between, for instance, two of them, um, BBC Media Action and, and Internews, we, we have a, uh, an in-country presence in perhaps 60 or 70 countries around the, the world. Um, if you look at those countries, um, many of them actually are in some of the, the most vulnerable hotspots for either rapid onset disasters or chronic crises. Um, <laughs> If you look at the, the 20 uh, media landscape guides that Info as Aid did conduct as part of this project, we have offices in many of those countries. So we have a standing presence. Very often we're working on long-term development programs, but what we've observed from those countries um, is that when disasters strike, actually we have uh, trusted platforms, trusted with communities, information platforms, that can reach those communities who are, who are, after all, the first responders. It's the communities themselves that respond first. Um, so we have access to them, very often in situations where humanitarian agencies don't have direct physical access because of security concerns or simply because of the, the vast kind of, the vast geographies involved. So a good example of that is with the floods uh, in, in 2009 in Pakistan, which affected 20, 20 million people plus across hundreds and hundreds of miles. And no, n no collective of agencies could ever reach them physically. And I think the platforms of BBC Media Action, BBC World Service, and also the, the local partnerships that Internews had across uh, Pakistan were really important in that sense. So we, we observed that actually we did actually have, I think, <coughs> capabilities that were, were relevant. Um, I think we've also, over the past decade, increased our, our research and learning capability and also our interest in, in advocacy, in, in, in our interest in building the evidence base that aid, that, that part of aid provision is around information. Information is an aid deliverable and actually communication is part of humanitarian accountability. So we found that we have started to have not exactly matching capacities, but similar type capacities to some of the humanitarian agencies. We've also, we've also found that they've started to come to us for advice about how to communicate with uh, communities in the areas in which both they and we are working, and they're aware that we do have those relations with, with local media. But we've also realized that we need advice from from the agencies themselves. Uh, a lot of the, the well-established agencies, including those that took part in the five learning um, projects, they've, they've worked out how to sort of structure both their, their 
in-country operations, which are working on long-term programs, and their emergency response units, and then how they actually interrelate when a disaster strikes. We have, you know, we, and we, we need that insight and that experience. Equally, we are realizing that there are more and more actors in the space, in the business of communicating in disasters. It's not just uh, the large media development agencies, it's not just the humanitarian agencies, there's a new generation of kind of tech-oriented players, such as Frontline SMS, such as Ushahidi, who are also uh, moving into the space. And actually, coordination is becoming a problem. So we have a lot to learn from the, the sector in terms of how to coordinate. And the communicating with uh, disaster-affected communities network initiative, about which you'll hear a little bit later from Richard, uh, is part of that response, mm -hmm. and that's that's something that's come from our learnings of the our, lear our learnings from the the mainstream sector. So there's some context for you about the changing role of of media development <coughs> agencies. Now back to learnings from this paper. <laughs> this paper is great. I, I highly recommend it to you. I, I read it on the Eurostar on the way back from Brussels last night, and I thought, wow, there are at least. 25 takeaways from this paper, and my own version is just scribbled all over. There's, there's, there really is a lot in there. I, I've kind of shortlisted six, um, six, um, six areas, some of which were also highlighted in, in the video that uh, we've just seen. Um, the first one for me was the importance of, um, of assessment, right? Information as access uh, assessments that, uh, and information needs assessments, uh, that don't just look at need and don't just look at the presence of local media, but they also look at the telecoms landscape. And I think in the case of the uh, Wajira um, pilot, there, there, was, there was a slight problem encountered because not all of the communities that receive mobile phones actually uh, uh, were within the footprint of a mobile phone mm -hmm. network. I'd add to that that it's becoming increasingly important to look not just at the telecoms infrastructure when you're actually designing programs, but also understand the social media landscape. Um, and that, of course, becomes very relevant when you're looking at kind of media-rich uh, uh, sort of contexts. Um, and arguably, many of these projects took, took place in not quite media dark areas, but media gray, where actually the communications infrastructure was not that dense. Um, it's also worth flagging that uh, Anita's point about trying to change the system, trying to change it from outside mm. is tough. One of the achievements of Info as Aid was to actually get the system, uh, i.e. The, uh, the humanitarian system coordinated by OCHA, to incorporate yeah. into its information needs assessment the rapid assessments that take place within 72 hours, four questions, four questions about information needs. So that really is an achievement in, in influencing the, the system. And that's come about through, through Info's aid. Mm. Um, the, the second thing that struck me was um, that uh, the, the weekly information about market prices, um, um, it did empower uh, the pastoralists to negotiate or to bypass, to either negotiate with or bypass the middlemen. But um, it, it's very clear, and we know this from elsewhere, that information is an enabler of markets. That's exactly the model and role of Bloomberg. But actually, what there's a bit of a gap that no one has really looked at how information, market-related information, can help actually economies recover after disasters and really look at look at providing market specific information so there's almost like a, a role for a, a humanitarian bloomberg that isn't in the picture right now um, but it's an important part of recovery it's to deliver it's to create and support information systems that are related to the functioning of markets um, the third thing that struck me which came across very clearly from the video was the the importance of um, the local radio partnerships, um, not just to reach <coughs> local populations with mm. quality, <coughs> relevant, appropriate information, but to also elicit from them 
through interactive um, devices. That's a, that's maybe just a, a jargon <laughs> for kind of phoning programs, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, elicit from them information about wider needs that perhaps uh, went beyond the immediate concerns of some of the agencies working there. Um, yeah. And secondly, to sort of generate dynamics that um, positive dynamics that were just not comparable with having a closed kind of discussion led by an agency with a community. And those dynamics uh, generated trust, but they also generated kind of political waves quite often that meant actually that there had to be a response be because, because it was in the public domain, because the, uh, the, 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 the radio station had broadcast it to the entire community, something had to be done. So it's both the, I think, the different kind of dynamic, but the fact that actually um, working with local media, uh, trusted channels, does very often generate greater responsiveness because of the political dimension of it. Um, looking at the, the hub, the hubs that were created, mm -hmm. I, um, I felt that this is, this is great. This is kind of like having a, a central nervous system in each agency that processes information coming from uh, affected communities. Uh, that's the concept and it played out well in certain cases. What was clearly <coughs> missing was when information came in that actually didn't relate to the, the specific program that an agency was running. And it seemed to me that what you did need was a, a kind of a switchboard or a clearinghouse um, for that kind of information. And I think that's where the, uh, the, the CDAC network kind of approach does come in, which is to create a platform that's broader than any one agency and, uh, and its specific set of programs. Um, the um, one other thing that came across was on, on the issue of efficiency and effectiveness. There was reference in the video to, uh, oh, it, it appears that using SMS has driven, has driven costs cost down, right? Um, this, the, this, the central importance, and this was something that was beyond the remit of this, um, this paper and the learning reviews, is to actually tackle the question of cost effectiveness um, and to actually look at the kind of value for money or not, right, mm -hmm. of the communications approach. Um, interviews, we have some interesting data that we'd love to have externally um, validated about our work in Haiti, which was that uh, we, we broadcast every day for two years um, and to 78% uh, of the population, and we believe it cost six pence a day to reach, uh, to reach wha uh, one person, right, with the entire range of humanitarian response, uh, recovery, um, and reconstruction related information. Six pence a day per person, right? Now we would love to have that information validated independently, uh, and we would, we would love there to be more investments in, in those kinds of approaches, because we, we, we do understand that investment in humanitarian aid takes, takes place in an increasingly kind of contested context um, here, in, here in Europe. Um, the last thing that struck me was, and, and Anita um, brought this up, uh, as did Carol, was uh, you've agencies really do need to invest in the kind of the, the staffing capacity, right, to actually take this information, use these information platforms, um, and actually analyze analyze what's coming from communities, and then feed it out into the operational program um, areas of their, of their agencies. That, that requires work. And um, this paper, I think, has done a, a, good, a good job in actually providing uh, some evidence that the investment in those staff is appropriate and it is needed, right? But there has to be an investment from agencies in staffing up. And frankly, it we have a feeling at times that actually humanitarian agencies are actually falling behind and we see more in greater investments from governments, for instance the Philippine, the Philippine government uh, over the recent typhoon, the Indonesian government, the Japanese government uh, in actually uh, investment in these areas than humanitarian agencies themselves. So they do need to, to catch up. 
I think the last thing that's uh, implicit in this is that um, this area of practice has its own contribution to make to emerging humanitarian policy. This area of uh, this this area called resilience, and other people sitting in this room have resilience uh, <laughs> on their business cards, <laughs> right? <laughs> if you read the paper, there's a reference to resilience around the um, uh, the the link between quality information being provided around livelihood, r livelihood related information um, linked to uh, protection response against drought. And you see that in the video as well. Um, uh, better tr drought resistance crops or how to increase the productivity of your, your chickens. Well, it's actually, it's perhaps what could be more explicit, it's not actually the information itself I, I, I think that's relevant to resilience as much as it's the quality of the set of relationships between the, the humanitarian agencies, the communities, the local media, the providers of critical information infrastructure, of which there are not so many in the Horn of Africa, but it's those iterations, it's those relationships, and it's building those networks that actually I think can be the great contribution of this emerging um, sector, the, 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 the CDAC, with a small c, the CDAC sector, um, can be the great contribution to this emerging and important um, area of practice. So it's not the information in itself, but of course quality information appropriately is, is important. It's the iterations, it's the relationships, it's the configurations between the, the different actors that is, is vital. And I think Info as Aid has really done a great job in bringing these different actors together. So with that, I'd, I'd like to finish. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mark. I think those are some really uh, interesting observations that we can all, uh, all consider.